Can you walk up a little bit? Yep. You know, why don't we just go to the beach and film the intro there? I feel like it's better on the island to have some like beautiful footage rather than starting where we end. Sounds good. Sounds good. Let's go. Okay. Welcome to the Ogasawara Island chain. You may know it as Peel Colony, or the Boonin Islands, or Farfana. And in truth, the fact that there's four names, in fact, five names for this island over the last 200 years, shows just how much history has happened in this tiny place. Given how isolated it is, it's over a thousand kilometers from mainland Japan, the closest major nation, you would be forgiven in thinking that nothing important had happened here, that this was a remote Pacific tropical land, but not important to history. And you couldn't be more wrong. This island chain bookends one of the most violent expansionist empires in human history. But before it was a part of that empire, it was part of the colonization schemes of the West. The first people to come to these islands, despite its remote Pacific location, were the Spanish. The Spanish arrived off these shores in 1527, and they called these islands, due to their remote location, the Orphans, or as it's been bastardized, La Farfana. They were followed by the Dutch, who renamed it and went on their way, followed up again almost a hundred years later by the Japanese. And this is interesting to me because these islands are Japanese and they're so close to Japan in comparison and yet they were the third to arrive. And they arrived because of a fishing boat that was blown off course by a typhoon. Not even an intentional push out, but an accident. And so the Japanese government quickly sent some cartographers here to map it out and they decided, well, since nobody lives here, we should call it the Bunin or uninhabited islands. And this comes back to bite them. Because just a few centuries later, the British arrive, and in true British style, take a small copper plate, set it on the shore, and say, ours. There are no people here, but ours. And knowing that someone's going to come along after them, the British decide to send out a small expeditionary force of colonists. And they pick up a dozen Hawaiians or so, a few listless Europeans, and most notably, one American by the name of Nathaniel Savory. And it's important to note this because Nathaniel Savory and the choices he makes have an incredibly profound effect on the history of these islands. Just a few decades after those British settlers arrive here, America arrives, the American Empire arrives in the name of Commodore Perry. And Commodore Perry has been sent by the United States to open up trade with Japan. Japan is one of the last Eastern nations to open up to the West. And Perry, he arrives into these shores and he meets Nathaniel Savory. And in Perry's mind, his trip over here has been kind of an annoyance because virtually every time he has to stop to get new wood for his boat, new food for his people, new water to survive, it's a British colony he's stopping in. And to an American who's starting the new great American empire, that's a shame. He doesn't want to have to pay this exorbitant fee to come and dock in someone else's colony. So he decides, I'm going to buy some land here in Ogasawara, and I'm going to turn it into an American colony. And so he goes up to this man, Nathaniel Savory, and he says to him, is there any land you could sell me? Could you perhaps give me uh, a plot over here or a plot over there? And Savory, who has absolutely no right to do so, absolutely no right, sells him the most important plot on the island. And so America decides, well, we're going to call it Peel Island, and it's going to be our colony. Britain's not happy about this. Japan's not happy about this. But America's pretty pleased with themselves. However, I think this is where the story gets really interesting because Japan starts to take notice. So for the next half of this story, it's probably best we go back to those rocks that we started at. Perry's arrival to Japan comes at a really weird time in both Japanese and American history. 
It's a civil war in both countries, but the difference is that the civil war in the United States is about internal politics, whereas the civil war in Japan is more about external politics. Japan has seen the West arrive on its shores. Now Perry has arrived with a gunboat in their harbor and demanded by force that Japan start trading with the West. And that's after 200 years of a system called Sakoku, where the Japanese would literally kill any Westerner who set foot on their land and any Japanese who left the island. So this is a huge, fundamental change in the Japanese system. They've gone from what's called a shogunate to an imperial system, an empire. And that is a change that, if you lived through it, must have been so incredibly profound. And America was going through a very similar profound change. But it was going through the changes of a growing empire in the West. It was coming over here with improved technology, improved weaponry, and as you can see by the fact that they made it here, improved colonization. So Japan looks at them, they look at the Dutch, the English, the Portuguese arriving on their shores, and they say, if we don't start dominating now, we're going to be dominated. They look at what's happening in China with the opium wars, where the British were buying so much tea that to solve the trade imbalance, they had two wars to force China to use opium, something that the Chinese were completely against. And Japan looked at that and said, are we next? What about us? So they started thinking, okay, well, where do we colonize? How do we start expanding too? What is the first place we could go to? And they went back to their records and they start looking through and they find the Boonin Islands, these uninhabited islands that America's in. And they look at the United States and they're in a civil war. I don't think they're ready to come here and fight. And so now the new Japanese government is thinking, well, okay, if we're going to colonize, if we're going to become this expansionist outward seeking empire, where do we go first? And how do we take it when we get there? What's going to hold back the West from taking it the moment that we colonize it ourselves? So they look to Ogasawara, where they'd been a few hundred years before, and they say, okay, well, America's in the midst of a civil war, and all Britain had to do to take the land was leave a little copper plate, so why don't we one-up them both? Why don't we leave these giant stones here that basically scrawl in the earth, we own these islands. They're ours. And we'll send a couple hundred colonists rather than a few dozen. And so the Japanese start to populate this land, despite it being an American colony, on the belief that America is so preoccupied with its internal problems that it's not going to go out into the Pacific for a major war. And they're right. But in being right, they've also taught themselves an awful lesson. What they've taught themselves is that if they start to take land, people might not take it back. If they have a little bit of legal recourse, if they follow the Western style of conquering, of colonization, well, it's gonna work. People won't mind as much in the West, as long as they do it in the Western style. And this is a really bad lesson because it leads to some of the greatest atrocities in human history. The Japanese then look around and they say, well, the only other semi-populated or almost uninhabited island chain are the Kurils, just north of Hokkaido. So they make a deal with Russia, let's split them in half. Let's go to Okinawa, where we've sort of had a vassal state system going for a few hundred years, and we'll take it properly. But now they're sort of out of places. Now they need to take countries, places that everyone would understand was already a stable international system. And that's where they start to run up against the West again. They take Korea, and not to defend Korea, but because they kind of wanted it themselves, the Russians declare war on Japan, saying, you can't do this. And everybody expects Russia to win, of course. They have a bigger navy. They have Western military. They are a much bigger power. But they lose the war. And they lose the war twice in a row. 
And this absolutely fundamentally changes the view of Japan. It changes it both here in Japan, but also in the eyes of the West. Japan is now considered an expansionist power, and they take full charge of it. They start expanding into China, into Manchuria, down into Formosa, modern day Taiwan. They continue as the war goes on into the Philippines, Singapore, even down into Burma. And in their eyes, at least in their propaganda, this isn't imperialism. This is anti-imperialism. We're kicking out the Westerners. And then you'll be ruled by an enlightened people, an Eastern people, the Japanese people. And in their mind, they can take everything. They could take over the entire Pacific. They're the natural leaders of the Pacific. Why wouldn't they be in charge? But that's kind of a problem because there's one other major empire in the Pacific who they haven't declared war on yet. And so in the late 1930s, they begin planning a war against the other Pacific empire, the American empire. It's the wrong decision. It's a bad move. In less than a decade, everything that they had taken, all that their empire had gained was lost. America pushed back with such force and such power that the Japanese empire crumbled to a point that it wasn't at for 150 years. And standing here at this bunker, we see one of the final vestiges of World War II, one of the last battles where the Japanese empire here on this island, Chichijima and just off the coast in Iwo Jima, learned that they were not invincible that their empire was coming to a close and there was nothing that could be done about it. This right here, just this symbolic bunker shows the end of an empire, the tail end of a vicious expansionist Pacific empire. 15 meters separate those stones from this bunker, but between these two lies an empire. This is truly rare earth. Fifteen meters over here. Oh. <laughs> 